as you know, ranges over many books and articles on China, international relations, and a lot of other related issues, some of which we're gonna be discussing in detail today. Our focus here is PRI's new book available in hard copy and also as a free ebook download in our website, pop.org, pop.org. It's called Pandemonium and it's a powerful analysis of what the virus has done to the world and what certain powerful groups in the world are doing using the China virus as their excuse. That's right, as the virus lingers on around the world, it has a powerful impact, not only in the United States, but around the world. Political leaders, magnates in many sectors are taking advantage of it and we're gonna go right to that issue in a moment. They're trying to grow their power and influence. Get our free ebook to look at how the world is dealing with this from several countries. These firsthand reports are free and they're available right now on our website at pop.org. Right at the top of the page, Pandemonium is yours in a free ebook download. Today, we're talking about the worldwide impact, focusing on major players, China, the UN, big tech, big business, and just the worldwide big guys. Welcome, Steve Moser, and thanks for joining us. Well, thanks for hosting this show, Chris, on behalf of the Population Research Institute and really on behalf of uh, everyone out there who not only supports us and helps us in various ways, but for everyone who's interested really in finding out the truth about the crises that we've, the man-made crises that we've lived through uh, for most of the past year. Steve, let's start with the international groups taking advantage of the China virus. What's it all about? Well, you know, we used to say uh, back in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, those of us who were concerned about national sovereignty, about individual liberty, as uh, you and I and our listeners are, uh, we used to worry that uh, the United Nations would grow beyond its original mandate of simply uh, helping with, uh, uh, to reduce conflict in various far corners of the world. And we used to worry about the, the UN uh, and its desire to have a standing army and its ability, desire to have the ability to tax. And of course, if you have a standing army and the ability to tax, uh, then you are a de facto government, whether you call yourself a government or not. But uh, the, the UN has certainly uh, sought during the course of the past year to increase its budget and its cre increase its control over our lives, uh, both directly as an organization and uh, indirectly through the World Health Organization, whose response to the China virus has been an absolute disaster. And this brings me to, my, to, to, to the point that I was coming to, and that is that the, the UN, uh, although it has grandiose notions of its own about its role in its dominant role in the future world, is being hollowed out from within by the Chinese Communist Party. Mm -hmm. So we have an interesting sort of agenda within an agenda here. And, and what do I mean by that? Well, uh, China is very, very aggressively trying to gain control of agencies of the United Nations, all right? Uh, we know that uh, uh, the, the, the chessboard here, take a, take a bigger look at the chessboard here because the UN itself has 15 specialized agencies, including the World Health Organization, mm -hmm. uh, but also things like the World Intellectual Property Organization, uh, things like that. And what China has been trying very aggressively to do over the last 20 years or so is gain control of those organizations uh, by electing its people to the top. It already controls five of the 15 uh, organizations, agencies under the United Nations. Controls them in the sense that there is a, a national a citizen of the People's Republic of China serving in the top spot at those agencies. Now, bear in mind that the Chinese Communist Party does not allow anyone to serve an international agency without serving the Chinese Communist Party first, right? These are Communist Party officials who are then tasked by the party to serve Communist Party interests uh, if they're the head of the uh, World Health Organization, for example. Now, in the case of the World Health Organization, uh, we don't have a Chinese national there. 
Uh, we have the next best thing. We have Dr. Tedros Ghebreyesus, who is a communist from Ethiopia, who is a proxy uh, for the Chinese Communist Party. And almost really, we could say a colonial type proxy because Ethiopia is one of the ends of China's massive overseas expansion program called the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, the People's Republic of China has literally spent billions of dollars building infrastructure, railroads and port terminals and, and uh, uh, roads and buildings inside of Ethiopia. And it picked uh, Dr. Ted Rose, who's not a medical doctor, by the way, to be the head of the World Health Organization. And for some reason, uh, back in late 2016, when the matter was up before the UN for a vote, uh, the United States under the Biden-Obama administration went along with the Chinese Communist Party's choice for the World Health Organization. So you can really say that one of the causes of the pandemic that we're all living through is the fact that that under the Obama-Biden administration, we took our eye off the ball and we allowed China to directly and indirectly control uh, many of the agencies of the United Nations, agencies that we're the principal funder of, by the way, to add insult to injury, including allowing them to put their man, a colonial proxy, Dr. Tedros Cabrisas, in as the head of the World Health Organization. And think about all the problems that have stemmed from that. Uh, think about the fact that back in, in January, uh, when Dr. Tedros flew to Beijing and had a meeting, a face-to-face -face meeting with uh, China's new red emperor, Xi Jinping, that he glad-handed the new red emperor, that he came out of that meeting saying, repeat, repeating uh, like, a, like a parrot, uh, the phrases that uh, Xi Jinping himself had used, saying, I'm in charge, everything is under control, I know we, we, we will contain this, uh, this threat and the world need not worry about it. Uh, that of course was a statement that has literally cost hundreds of thousands of lives around the world because just at the time that we were beginning in January to worry uh, in a big way about the spreading epidemic in China and the fact that it was spreading to other parts of the world like Italy, we were told by the head of the World Health Organization not to worry to let down our guard. And many countries did. Many countries thought that the World Health Organization was actually primarily concerned about the world's health, as you might think. Instead, it turns out to be primarily concerned about the parroting the party line of the Chinese Communist Party, which in the early days was intent upon minimizing the danger of the pandemic. So we see again, the United Nations uh, seeking to aggrandize itself in this crisis. But working within the United Nations, we have an even more powerful player, the Chinese Communist Party, seeking to hollow out, to control uh, these international organizations that the United States actually set up after World War II. And, and now they're being turned against the United States, against the West, uh, by the Chinese Communist Party and used for its purposes. So this is a very dangerous trend uh, that we have underway. Uh, President Trump did exactly the right thing by withdrawing funding from the World Health Organization because you might as well change its name to the, I don't know, the, the, the China Health Organization. It's certainly not concerned about the health of the world, the health of you and I. It's concerned about the political health of the Chinese Communist Party and spreading Communist Party propaganda around the world. So we've been very badly served uh, by these international organizations, in part because they've been compromised by the Chinese Communist Party, Chris. Well, way back in the Carter era, uh, we got uh, China on uh, into the UN and onto the National Security Council, as I recall. Uh, uh, the, sorry, the uh, sec UN Security Council. And uh, they have a veto, they have a vote, but where do they get their allies in the UN? Uh, there isn't a Soviet Union uh, uh, gathering of 28 countries that are occupied by China, are there? Where do they get their allies? Well, of course, the United Nations has, has the General Assembly, which is kind of the uh, House of Representatives of, of the United Nations uh, organizational chart. And, and then, of course, it has the Security Council, which is, was envisioned to be a kind of Senate. 
uh, where the major players in the world, China, uh, the Soviet Union, now Russia, the United States, uh, Great Britain, France would have permanent seats. And then there would be uh, uh, several rotating members who would be elected for fixed terms. Well, it hasn't worked out very well in practice because both of these, both the so-called Senate, the, the Security Council, and the so-called House of Representatives, the General Assembly, have been compromised in various ways. Uh, I mentioned that China has been trying to compromise the UN agencies and has succeeded in compromising many. And I should say here that even those agencies that it does not directly head now uh, by placing its nationals in charge, and even those agencies where it doesn't have a colonial proxy like Dr. Tedros Cabrisis in the World Health Organization, you will always find at the second tier and third tier, you will find many, many nationals of the Chinese, uh, uh, well, I say of China, but they're really representatives of the Chinese Communist Party. So the, the degree of corruption and co co-optation uh, that has taken place, co-option that's taken place inside these agencies is, is tremendous, although much of it flies under the radar. In terms of the General Assembly, uh, we know that China, the Chinese Communist Party advances its interest by corrupting and co-opting elites overseas. And they spend a significant amount of money, uh, not just directly on foreign aid, uh, but also through their United Front Department, it's called the United Front Works Department of the Chinese Communist Party. And the United Front Works Department uh, will go to a, an official, uh, maybe the prime minister, uh, maybe a senior official in the government, uh, the minister of defense, for example, in an African country or Latin American country, relatively poor country, and, and offer them an under the table bribe. On top of the table, of course, will be all expense paid trips to Beijing uh, and uh, where you're put up in a five-star hotel and you're treated like visiting royalty. But there will be under the payment, under the table payments as well uh, given to corrupt officials. And I think as you once told me, Chris, if, uh, if you take the first bribe, uh, you might as well take all the rest. And so China advances its interest by corrupting officials around the world. And, in some cases, sadly, it's all too easy to corrupt officials who live in countries where uh, corruption is a standard practice. But even in, in, in nascent democracies, even in fledgling democracies where uh, people are trying to establish the rule of law and, uh, and, and the other accoutrements of, uh, of democratic rule, you see China going in and setting that process in reverse, uh, corrupting elites. Uh, they have, uh, in, in one report, we know they have one company that has detailed information on several million elites around the world. These are people who are politically active. They're active in the local economy. They may be uh, in the military or police force, but they're all people of influence. And China has detailed dossiers on all of these people and is collecting more information at the same time. And so it, it understands who has been corrupted who can be corrupted, what their vulnerabilities are. I think right now we have a, a, a live living color example of the way this corruption works in the Hunter Biden scandal uh, because the Biden family, I think was, was rightly seen by the Chinese Communist Party as a soft target uh, for these kinds of, of corrupt influence mm -hmm. operations. And so they were offered sweetheart deals and of course, once you're involved in a sweetheart deal with the Chinese Communist Party, the pleasant uh, tea drinking, smiling face of the Communist Party official who has, who has corrupted you disappears. And you see the snarling face of the dragon because you are uh, in a sense under their paw or under their claw uh, from thence forward. So um, we see that happening all around the world. Back to the UN. Uh, the, uh, the Chinese Communist Party generally now wins votes in the General Assembly of the United Nations because it has corrupted and co-opted enough governments around the world so that the General Assembly no longer functions uh, anything like uh, the U.S. House of Representatives. It's no longer democratic in the sense of representing the will of the people of the, the 170 or so countries that are represented. It represents the will of the Chinese Communist Party. 
And in the, gen and in the, the uh, Security Council, of course, as you mentioned, China took over in 1972, the seat that had been occupied by our good long-term US ally, the Republic of China on Taiwan. And of course, since taking over the Security Council seat in 1972, it has a veto on everything uh, the Security Council uh, may consider, every action the Security Council may consider taking around the world. And so effectively, both the General Assembly and the Security Council have already been corrupted by the Chinese Communist Party. And of course, those facts alone have caused tremendous damage uh, to the international order uh, that was set up by the United States after World War II and to the world at large. Um, you know, I, I just have to keep telling you that China's successful attempt to control basically every organization within the UN uh, directly and through their colonial powers, through bribery and other things, has caused tremendous damage uh, to the United States and, and to the world and to democracies everywhere. Well, it sounds, it sounds very much like China, quite apart from the UN, is an international actor with uh, equal or even more powerful uh, hold on its client states and its client politicians and other businesses. And of course, the funding that China gives both within the United States and to African countries and Latin American countries for so-called development, always going into debt to China for their new docks, for their new railroads, for their new bridges. Now, that doesn't happen through the UN. China is acting as its own international agency. Well, it is, and it's acting uh, like a colonial power, except I would argue that it is even more uh, repressive and exploitative as a colonial power than Great Britain or France uh, or other countries were. And I say that because uh, when, for example, the British came to India uh, and, and ruled India first under the British East India Company and then later on directly by assigning a British governor, uh, they, of course, profited uh, from trade between India and Great Britain, but they also built schools and educated millions mm -hmm. of Indians. They also built the railroad system that helped to unite the disparate states of India, which are often peopled by people of different ethnicities and languages, helped to unify India into a single uh, subcontinent. It also, uh, and, and perhaps uh, best of all, uh, besides introducing a modern healthcare system to India, also in, uh, introduced democratic rule to India. And it was not very long ago that the former prime minister of India went to Great Britain and actually thanked uh, Great Britain for bringing modern education, modern transportation, modern means of communication, modern medicine and democracy to India. Now, no country in the world will ever thank the People's Republic of China for bringing democracy to its shores, because instead of democracy, China brings tyranny and one party dictatorship. That's its appeal, of course, to third, third world dictators who work closely with it. But China also does not bring things like uh, modern medicine and modern education to these countries either. It is almost a purely uh, exploitative relationship. And there's no greater uh, example proof of how the exploitation is taking place than these agreements that are signed between Kenya uh, and the People's Republic of China or between Sri Lanka and the People's Republic of China. If you sign on to the Belt and Road Initiative, China pretends to loan you money to build a port or a railroad terminal or a railroad or a road or a building, uh, but under the terms of the loan, you have to bring in a Chinese construction company, usually a military construction company, to construct the port or railroad terminal or railroad or road. So you wind up taking the loan and paying it back to China uh, for the construction of the railroad terminal or the port. And then you have to pay back the loan itself. And if you can't pay back the loan, what happens is the port or the railroad reverts to Chinese control. And so it becomes uh, Chinese property. The Chinese engineers run it. Uh, Chinese security forces 
paramilitary forces provide security for it. And virtually overnight, you then have a kind of uh, a treaty port or colony uh, in your country. And all you did was take a loan from the People's Republic of China, and now China owns you. So that's what's happening to many of these Belt and Road loan packages. It's called debt trap diplomacy. You wow. offer people a loan, and actually you inveigle them into accepting a huge amount of debt, which then converts to ownership, to equity, and you've lost control of part of your country. So this is the way China behaves in the economic realm. So it really shouldn't surprise people that it behaves the same way in the health realm. And I don't know that we've talked about this in the previous live streams, but we should, we should say here that China knew it was spreading deliberately a pandemic around the world. It created the China virus in the lab. It created it to be highly infectious and somewhat deadly. It then spread it around the world by allowing flights uh, to leave from mm -hmm. Wuhan and other Chinese cities all around the world while stopping flights from the epicenter of the epidemic, Wuhan, from flying to other parts of China. So they tried to dampen down, tamp down the epidemic in China while spreading it around the world. But, and here's the point, at the same time that they were spreading the virus around the world, the word went out to China's agents to snap up at fire sale prices any PPE they could get their hands on. And so Chinese agents were out in Europe, in Italy, in Spain, uh, in Australia, New Zealand, in the United States, Canada, buying up PPE, buying up goggles, buying up face masks, uh, buying up all of the things that we, that it knew that the mm -hmm. world would soon be in desperate need of. They bought it up very cheaply because at the time, the pandemic had not reached worldwide portions. And then by the time Australia, for example, realized that it had an epidemic on its hands, that the China virus had indeed come to its shores in a big way, it looked in its medical stores and found nothing. It found that it only had a few days supply of face masks and uh, personal protective equipment, uh, the head to toe coverings that the medical personnel needed to wear to prevent them from contracting the coronavirus. And when they did an investigation, when Italy did an investigation, Spain did an investigation, they found that the month before, Chinese agents had been going around the country buying up all of the PPE, all of the face masks. Now, to add insult to injury, not only did they cause a severe shortage of PPE around the world, including uh, here in, um, in, 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 in Florida, where I'm speaking uh, to you now from, uh, in Florida, my wife in, in February, at my uh, instruction, uh, went to the local pharmacy to buy a couple of boxes of face masks. And she found she couldn't buy any because a couple of days before, a Chinese doctor had visited the pharmacy and bought out their entire stock. <laughs> so we were personally affected by uh, China's worldwide uh, sort of uh, you know, confiscation of all the PPE and all the masks. But what happened then was even worse because once the epidemic reached pandemic proportions in Europe and Australia, and those countries were desperate to get their hands on face masks and PPE, uh, China was then selling the PPE that it had bought the month before very cheaply, very dearly. It was selling it at very, very high prices. So it spread an epidemic around the world and then profited off the epidemic by selling uh, PPE and face masks at you know, five or 10 times uh, the actual cost of production. So you know, it, it doesn't get uh, more despicable than that. I mean, we, we throw around the words like deplorable and despicable a lot <laughs> when we're talking about politics in the United States. But the behavior of the Chinese Communist Party on so many levels has been not just deplorable, but despicable and, and almost anti-human that it, that it boggles the imagination. But imagine that you spread a sickness around the world, you, you, you uh, scarf up all the equipment you can uh, and then sell it back to desperate people who are dying uh, at, at uh, exorbitant prices. Well, you're making a market, I guess, for your own product and that's only a sidebar.
uh, because the strategic goals that China has in mind are beyond the virus and they, it sounds like they're making great advances on that score. Uh, what are their primary long range goals using the virus as a springboard to achieving them? Well, you know, the virus is a bioweapon that was developed in the Wuhan Institute of Virology and released deliberately upon the world. And I do not believe that China would have done that. The leaders of the Chinese Communist Party, Xi Jinping and the handful of members of the Standing Committee of the Politburo, uh, they wouldn't have taken that action unless they thought that it would play to China's advantage. And I think it has in some ways, uh, certainly in developing countries, uh, which entered the pandemic, of course, having very limited resources when it comes to healthcare. Um, primary healthcare systems that were not uh, fully functioning even at the best of times. And China was able to swoop in and, uh, and now China, of course, is trying to sell a vaccine uh, to the world that it reports that it developed in record time. Now, mm -hmm. I have to tell you that I'm skeptical about uh, the origin of the vaccine that comes from China uh, to deal with supposedly the China virus. And I'm skeptical about it because of the timing. Now think about, think about what we've done in the United States. Uh, we had Operation Warp Speed. Uh, the uh, Trump administration has spent $11 billion developing uh, seven, at least seven vaccines that are now in second and tertiary trials uh, in record time. Now, we're very careful about uh, vaccines because vaccines can easily cause more damage uh, than they cure. The, the cure can't be worse than, than the disease, as President Trump often says. And, and China certainly cut corners in its vaccine development. But I have a suspicion, Chris, and you, you, may, you, you may question this if you will, but from long experience with the Chinese Communist Party, I wonder if as soon as they developed the China virus in the lab, that they didn't start working then, maybe last year or the year before on a vaccine uh, that would be successful in immunizing people against this disease that they created. Uh, they might've had a pretty good head start here, it seems to me, which is why we uh, saw vaccine trials occurring in China as early as February, if, if, it, if it were true, and I don't believe it is, that China only realized that it had a new uh, epidemic caused by a new coronavirus on its hands in early January, there's no way they could have any vaccine candidates available by February to treat this supposedly new uh, and dangerous coronavirus. If on the other hand, they had developed it in the lab, which I believe they did, when, as soon as they had a final version of the COVID-19 virus, what we call SARS-CoV-2 uh, in technical terms, uh, they would have begun uh, you know, advertising, well, uh, not advertising, but uh, developing vaccine candidates. And that would put them far ahead of the United States and uh, the European countries in developing a vaccine. So I think they had a head start, and I think the head start is probably related to the fact that uh, this was created in the lab uh, sometime before it became uh, a pandemic unleashed upon the world, Chris. Well, uh, I wouldn't put it past them, uh, believe me. I don't doubt the fact that they have the will and the power to do that. Uh, I think President Trump has taken a pretty strong stand against them. Sadly, he's had some opposition from within our own country and other uh, political uh, elements because uh, they wanna be friendly to China for all sorts of reasons. But it's interesting that socialist governments and they are not alone, not just socialist governments uh, and globalist movements have tried to seize upon the virus pandemic to increase their own power. Uh, in our book, Pandemic, and by the way, folks, this is a free ebook download at our website at pop.org. Um, in Pandemic, we have testimonies from various countries about how Spain, uh, the UK, Argentina, 
have tried to maximize the virus panic in order to maximize their own power. And it's very interesting to me that not only have these foreign countries been doing this, but so have Chicago Mayor Lightfoot, California Governor Newsom, Virginia Governor Northam. Uh, they have continued what was once a two week, let's flatten the curve lockdown. And we're going into seven months now and they see no sign of letting up. And in fact, apparently they're waiting for President Biden to make a national lockdown reflect the complete house arrest that these various states and municipalities have already imposed. Uh, last night, uh, Governor, uh, uh, sorry, Chicago Mayor Lightfoot said, too many people are gathering in your home. You, that's where the virus is starting now, right there in your own home, implying, of course, that you ought to be ashamed of yourself for loving your family and not obeying me. Yeah, uh, I, I have to say there is a, a strong parallel uh, between the actions of uh, socialist governments in Spain, for example, and I think you would have to include uh, the uh, Angela Merkel uh, government in in Germany, which is kind of a, a uni party, a uni party government, um, uh, kind of equivalent to what we call in the United States the uh, the uni party, uh, the permanent bureaucracy and the deep state. Uh, those those governments uh, resemble uh, the the uh, the governments of certain American states uh, and certain American cities. You mentioned. Chicago Mayor Lightfoot, but I would also add to that Governor Murphy of New Jersey and Governor uh, Andrew Cuomo of New York City have seized upon the pandemic to uh, tighten controls again and again and again. It was 15 days to flatten the curve. Now it looks like it's going to be 15 months to flatten the American economy, to destroy the American family, and to institute uh, a permanent, permanent one-party rule. Uh, which is a frightening prospect, certainly, certainly for me. Um, mm -hmm. There are some countries uh, that have refused to go along uh, with this program. Uh, one of those countries uh, has been the country of Brazil under uh, President Bolsonaro, who said early on that, uh, that he was not going to impose a national lockdown on the country of Brazil. It had to be done on a state by state basis, depending upon the severity of the situation. He has also refused uh, to, to allow the uh, vaccine created by the Chinese Communist Party into his country uh, for fear that it may do more harm than good. It may contain certain uh, impurities, for example. It may contain other genetic information. Uh, I wouldn't trust uh, a, a vaccine out of China personally and uh, President Bolsonaro agrees with me. Another country that didn't, didn't immediately uh, go into a nationwide uh, panicked lockdown uh, was Taiwan. We used to call it the Republic of China on Taiwan. Uh, the democratic country of Taiwan saw the threat from China coming early, closed down air traffic from Wuhan and adjacent cities a day before President Trump did. And after that, uh, immediately uh, sought to, to um, make sure that anyone who had symptoms of the China virus was given immediate medical treatment, but they did not lock down the economy. They did not close all the small stores. They did not shut down and bankrupt all the restaurants and, and the service sector of the economy. Uh, they behaved in a, in a reasonable, uh, rational way. And I think that's, uh, that, that says a lot for why they've had so few cases of the China virus in Taiwan. They reacted early and they reacted uh, to protect the vulnerable and to prevent the virus from coming in to their country. So on the other hand, you have Great Britain now, you have Spain, uh, you have Italy, now going into a second lockdown, hard on the heels of the first. And the information we're given, Chris, is so confusing because first we're told by the, the, the preeminent expert in the United States, supposedly on viruses, Dr. Anthony Fauci, 
uh, that masks don't work, then they work. And, and now we're learning from studies that they may not work uh, very well in preventing the spread of the disease. Uh, we heard first, of course, from the World Health Organization that there was no human to human transmission. We didn't have to worry about it being spread in aerosol fashion through the air. Uh, we just had to be careful about not touching contaminated surfaces. Then we learned that it, we did have human to human transmission. Um, the, 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 the advice that we've been given is all over the map. And I'm, I'm, I'm really sorry to say that so much of it seems to be politically motivated that even the medical professionals who are supposed to be looking at the evidence, studying the China virus and deliberately deciding which therapeutics work and which don't, which vaccines may be efficacious and which aren't, and, and talking solely on the basis of, of the science of the matter, objective, hard science, are putting their fingers up in the wind and, and trying to gauge the political winds. Uh, they're trying to intervene in the political process to help one side or the other, and we know which side they're generally helping. And, and uh, not only has the mainstream media been terribly compromised uh, by this bias uh, against uh, President Trump and the Trump administration, which prevents them from speaking openly and honestly about the pandemic, we also see the medical establishment, including medical journals like The Lancet, uh, the British Medical Journal, these are journals that have existed for well over 100 years that exist to, to, to publish scientific studies. And yet we see in these journals fake uh, studies, uh, which, for example, uh, one study which claimed to have completely debunked uh, the usefulness of hydroxychloroquine was later shown to be false and had to be uh, taken out of the, uh, the medical journal that it was published in. But you see this, how politics is influencing everything, is seeping into even the pure science and making it very difficult for people like you and I, who simply want to be told what the risks are, uh, what the dangers are, and how we can cope with it. And instead, we're, we're being fed uh, the kind of propaganda that really uh, has more place in the uh, Global Times published by the Chinese Communist Party or the People's Daily published in Beijing uh, than it has place here in the United States, Chris. Well, the, uh, there are other powerful international actors, Davos, uh, big business, and so on. And in fact, uh, I wonder sometimes whether they're competing with China or cooperating uh, for instance, Greg uh, on YouTube, a watcher right now, has asked, is Bill Gates uh, connected to the Chinese vaccine? Uh, I thought he was. Yeah, uh, Bill Gates has been a big proponent of vaccines now for a number of years through the Gates Foundation. And for some reason, uh, he has spent a lot of time and money uh, developing a polio vaccine uh, for a disease polio that is no longer uh, a health threat anywhere in the world. Uh, but leaving that aside, he's a big proponent of vaccines uh, for everything and also for uh, a, a device that would be implanted under your skin to immediately tell people whether or not you have been vaccinated or not. So, um, Years ago, of course, uh, Bill Gates was a big proponent of population control and to a certain extent still is. Uh, I had an exchange with Bill Gates uh, probably 15 years ago uh, when uh, I challenged him uh, on the question of whether or not he should still be funding population control programs in the developing world. And uh, because birth rates everywhere were falling, even in countries in Latin America, Asia, and Africa, which historically had high birth rates, much higher than the birth rates in Europe and North America, for example, uh, we were seeing birth rates falling farther and faster than anyone thought possible. And his reply to me was, well, I'm only funding programs in, in countries where the population growth rate uh, is in, in excess of several percent a year. And I, 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 I went through the numbers with him at the United Nations from the United Nations Population Division and from the International Division of the US Census Bureau. And I showed him that, that except for a few islands in the Pacific, uh, there were no countries in the world uh, which anymore had 
uh, population increase rates of three, four or five percent a year because birth rates had fallen so far and so fast. So I don't know whether that was one of the things that, that prompted him to move instead into, into vaccines. But the other thing that, that I argued to him was this, that um, we should really be responding here to the better angels of our nature. Instead of, instead of trying to force the birth rate down by imposing abortion, sterilization, contraception on people's who don't necessarily want those things, who actually value children and who want uh, to have three or four or five children. Uh, why don't we focus on reducing the infant and child mortality rate? Because the reason why people in, in many poor countries have three and four and five children is because they anticipate one or two or three of their children will be lost in infancy and childhood to some communicable disease or other. Uh, they'll be lost to, to typhus or typhoid or dysentery or, or malaria uh, or other diseases that are just endemic in, uh, in, in poor countries, especially in equatorial regions. So instead of trying to force down the birth rate, why don't we force down the death rate? Because what happens when the death rate falls, when more of your children survive to adulthood, is most couples being, being rational will decide to have fewer children. Right now they have large families in part for various reasons, but some of them have an extra child or two just for insurance because they're afraid that they will lose a child or two before adulthood. And they depend on their children for support in old age. So it's also the only social security program that many of these people have access to is called their own children uh, who will support them in old age when certainly not the government will not because there's no social security um, in, in many of these countries, poor countries around the world. So, um, so Bill Gates has gone into vaccines in a big way and uh, is spending a lot of money on vaccines. But, but you know, the, the, the ideal vaccine solution to the China virus uh, may not be ideal for humanity. Now think about what a virus is. A virus uh, is totally dependent upon a host to replicate itself and survive. So if you want to eliminate a virus from the human population, all you need to do, I say all you need to do sort of tongue in cheek, is to isolate everybody in individual cells until they either die of the virus or their body develops an immune response to the virus and kills it off. And if during that process, you don't allow any human beings who have the virus to come in contact with any human beings who don't have the virus, then you're going to kill the virus. You can actually eliminate uh, the virus enti entirely from the face of the planet by preventing it from spreading from one human being to another. Now, I believe that is Anthony that is the ideal world of virus eradication that people like Dr. Anthony Fauci live in. They think if we could just isolate everybody in individual cells, we can kill off the virus. Well, that's fine, except by doing that, you'll kill off the economy, you'll kill off uh, socialization for children, you'll kill off education for children, you'll kill off the family, you'll cause rising divorce rates, uh, rising unemployment rates, rising suicide attempts, some, you know, and some successful suicide attempts. So in other words, as President Trump says, the cure will be worse than the disease. But I think that was the, at the outset, that was the view of the Dr. Anthony Fauci's of the world. And it's entirely correct scientifically, but as a, a prudential matter, it is, it is insanity, Chris. Well, uh, I note with interest that uh... One of our listeners, uh, Susan, asks uh, uh, specifically about uh, China's impact on the United States elections upcoming. Um, there, we've talked about big tech, and uh, we've talked about uh, Davos and the international order that is so interested, and in, uh, that we want to delve into that. But Susan asks specifically: um, Is the Chinese the uh, goal with the coronavirus uh, to near-term influence the elections next week? 
Well, I think it certainly had that impact. And I believe that the, the China virus, what we could also call COVID-1984, because it's, it sent a lot of us into a sort of a dystopian existence here over the last few months in the United States and other countries. Uh, I think that the, the virus was deliberately released upon the world. And I, I believe that the timing uh, may very well not have been an accident. Uh, clearly, we had in January uh, the, the economic uh, situation in the United States was clearly the best that it had ever been. When you look at the low rates of unemployment, when you look at the high rates of economic growth, the kind of economic growth that, uh, that we were told uh, yeah, 10 years ago was impossible, that we would never see again, uh, we, had, we had reached again. Uh, over 3% economic growth per year, maybe uh, headed towards 4% uh, growth in GDP. Astonishing numbers for people who were on the other side of the equation thinking that America's decline was preordained and that we would never, uh, this, this 21st century would be the, uh, the century of China and not the second American century. So China unleashes a dangerous and deadly virus on the world and sends the American economy into a tailspin. Uh, leaves many of us locked up in our homes for weeks or months on end. Uh, clearly, I think the outcome was uh, favorable to China because it completely turned the political situation in America upside down. Right now, we have one political party whose only argument for electing them, uh, keeping them in power is the China virus. Without the China virus, I don't think that uh, the Democratic candidate for president, Joe Biden, would have much to talk about. Um, so it's been a great gift to him. And of course, um, if Biden wins, China wins, and America loses, because uh, we don't call Joe China Biden for nothing, or China Joe for nothing, because he's been in business with the Chinese Communist Party for a long, long time, big business, billion dollar business uh, over the last decade. And in return for that, he has uh, opposed uh, any action under the Obama-Biden administration against Chinese aggression in the South China Sea. He turned a blind eye to the building of military bases uh, on artificial islands in the South China Sea, violating the, uh, the, the rights of a half a dozen other nations uh, whose territorial waters include part of the South China Sea. He made excuses for human rights violations in China, either not bringing them up or when he did bring them up, such as the time he spoke about China's one child policy, he said, quote, I understand uh, why you uh, would embark upon a one child policy, he said, speaking to Chinese dictator Xi Jinping, uh, almost apologizing uh, for this policy, which has resulted in uh, the death of 400 million uh, unborn children in China uh, over the course of some 36 years. Uh, and then of course we have the ongoing uh, theft of intellectual property, the cyber war that China has been carrying out against the United States government and private entities over the last 20 years, the devaluing of, it, of its currency, the cheating on trade, uh, all, of the, all of the ways in which China has violated the international order, violated international agreements that it signed when it went into the World Trade Organization at, to its advantage, uh, taking advantage of American uh, workers, taking advantage of American consumers and destroying large segments of uh, America's industrial heartland. So all of this uh, uh, Joe Biden has been complicit in and, and we now know that he's uh, been not just complicit, he's been uh, an accomplice to. Uh, and and uh, so I think that the, uh, the election couldn't be, couldn't be clear in terms of uh, who China wants to win. Uh, China has been uh, quietly uh, lobbying on behalf of Joe Biden in countless ways. Uh, there are many bots in China, you know, the bots, the, the artificial intelligence robots that roam through the internet and plant things on Twitter and, and, and Facebook and Instagram and so forth have been very active uh, mm -hmm. over the course of the US presidential election. Uh, the the high-tech guys have shut down some of them, but they, they constantly pop back up again. It's like playing whack-a-mole 
Uh, you, can't, you can't kill all the bots all the time. Um, and the other thing that China has been doing through its agents of influence here, and there are many, many agents of influence here, uh, Newsweek just published a story about the fact that there were 600, 600 different organizations uh, in the United States, which have been set up by the Chinese Communist Party's United Front Department in order to influence American society and American government to view China in a favorable, uh, to put China in a flattering light. So China's uh, agents of influence in the United States are many and they are tireless and they're all working on behalf of um, Joe Biden and they're working against Donald Trump because Donald Trump has been over the last three and a half years, really very bad news for the People's Republic of China. Uh, he has set back their plans for uh, global domination uh, right now by at least a decade or more. And if he uh, gets a second term, uh, he will set back their plans by a generation or more, simply by insisting on a level playing field, simply by putting tariffs on Chinese made goods uh, to counteract the cheating that takes place, simply by uh, stopping their incessant cyber attacks and, and by unifying our allies against China. So um, there's a lot riding on this election for Americans, of course, but there's a lot riding on this election for the Chinese Communist Party as well which may, I think, uh, rise or fall, depending on whether or not Donald Trump gets another term in office. And as far as I'm concerned, um, I want my children and grandchildren uh, to live in a world which is led by the United States of America, uh, a world in which the United States is, is the predominant power. It will be a world that's freer, uh, safer, and, uh, and more prosperous than a world in which the Chinese Communist Party is the dominant power in the world. If that happens, the world will be a much darker place. Um, a twilight will descend upon the world and may remain for a long time. Chris? Well, we're getting a message from a former Hong Konger, Patrick, uh, who enjoyed very much your book, Bully of Asia, by the way. He says, well, now the whole world has seen China's true face. They pull back the curtain, so to speak, and including work like yours and the efforts of our own president. What would be its next step or, <clears throat> or steps? Would it behave like it has nothing to lose? Yeah, that's a very interesting question, Chris, because I think the, the, the economic uh, situation in China mm -hmm. is much more dire than the Chinese Communist Party will ever admit. Um, you know, of course, it's, it's, it's the numbers that it publishes about economic growth uh, and, and uh, industrial production are all fabrications. Uh, they're made up for political purposes. They have no necessarily uh, close resemblance to the actual reality of the economic situation in China today. Uh, we have now in China a political party of 92 million members which consumes about a trillion and a half dollars in wealth every year for its apartments and homes, its, its free chauffeured limousines, its foreign junkets, uh, the corruption, uh, the list goes on and on, and it produces nothing. So that's a trillion and a half dollar drag on the economy uh, produced as it were produced in quotes by the Chinese Communist Party. Then you have the state owned enterprises all of which operate at a loss. China Rail, for example, which runs those beautiful high-speed uh, rail trains that were stolen from, uh, the design of which was stolen from a European company some years ago. Uh, China Rail is $700 billion in debt. That money will never be paid back. Uh, the state-owned companies in China require subsidies amounting to, we estimate, about $4 trillion a year. So add up the $4 trillion to the trillion and a half, uh, about half of China's GDP of $12 trillion, $13 trillion, uh, is simply wasted uh, in this fashion. The only sector of the economy that really operates according to market principles is the export sector of the economy. And that sector is disproportionately focused on the American market. Well, what's happened to the American market? We now have put tariffs in place. And so the easy profits 
that the Chinese exporters were able to make by un undercutting American manufacturers and shipping goods to our shores without tariffs and flooding the stores at below market prices to, to gain market share and then create a monopoly that they could dominate thenceforward. Uh, that's all gone. The easy money is all gone. And the consumer sector of the economy is sputtering as well because remember the Chinese people have lived through hard times before. In the 1960s, 42 and a half million people in China starved to death. Uh, that's the, the elderly in China, the, the grandparents in China, remember that time. And so now that the China virus has hamstrung the Chinese economy, they're not spending money, they're saving money. They're not going to go out and buy a new car or a new apartment. They're going to hoard their wealth because they know that hard times are coming. So the export sector is sputtering, the, the consumer sector of the Chinese economy is sputtering. There's huge debt, both on the books and off the books. Uh, the on the books debt is about 350% of GDP. We worry because our national debt is about equivalent to our, our GDP. Uh, China's national debt is three and a half times its GDP and growing. And then you have the off the books debt, uh, local officials taking money out of their uh, treasury and loaning it to a local builder to build a building that nobody wants to live in, nobody wants to pay rent on. Uh, there's off the books debt as well in China. The whole Chinese economy is a Ponzi scheme. And the Ponzi scheme may very well have uh, reached tipping point with the China virus that China has unleashed upon the world. This is a long way of saying that would the Chinese government, would the Chinese Communist Party engage in a foreign adventure to distract uh, the Chinese people from the fact that uh, they've now got a food shortage in China, that many, many uh, factories of the export sector of the economy have closed down, that 70% of the foreign manufacturers in China are now thinking of picking up uh, their tents, pack, packing up their tents and moving to uh, more favorable climates like India or Mexico or the United States. All of that taken together is an economic tsunami coming. So would China engage in, an economic, in a military adventure in order to distract the, Amer the Chinese people from this looming disaster? Well, the answer is they already have. They're already making nasty, aggressive noises towards Japan in the Senkaku Islands near the Ryukyus, Okinawa, and the chain of islands stretching from southern Japan down to Taiwan. They're already making nasty, aggressive noises towards Taiwan, talking about an invasion. Uh, they're already uh, continuing their military buildup in the South China Sea, uh, encroaching upon the territorial waters of other countries. They're, they're continuing to encroach upon the national territory of the little countries of Nepal and Bhutan. They've moved into Northern India. I mean, uh, around all points of the compass, China is engage engaging in very, very aggressive actions. Um, are they hoping to spark a conflict, uh, to take the minds of the Chinese people away from the disaster uh, that the Chinese Communist Party has unleashed upon the Chinese people? Uh, I, I wouldn't put it past them. And then we wind up with Hong Kong where our friend Patrick was originally from. Hong Kong, a, a great once free city of 7.3 million people, which flourished for 150 years under the British rule of law, has now, is now in the process of being crushed uh, by the Chinese Communist Party and turned into just another Chinese city like Shanghai or Tianjin or Beijing itself, where the secret police rule and where the local legislature is nothing but a a shadow of its former self. It's a very sad thing to see, but we all have to, to look at it closely and, and learn the lesson that the only thing that China, that China really exports, the only export of the Chinese Communist Party is tyranny and one party dictatorship. And, and we don't want any part of that. Well, that's quite a wind up, Steve. Uh, folks, we've been listening with PRI President Steve Mosier and our focus today is the PRI book that is available, hard copy and free as an ebook download right now as you sign off of our program at pop.org. It's called Pandemonium. It tells what the virus has done to the world from the points of view of people all over the world. And it's really fascinating. We have it in Spanish and English editions. 
Now get it at pop.org and please join us for our next interviews. And by the way, send along in the comments section of these various, uh, uh, these various services, what ideas you have for more interviews that we could do from here at the PRI office. Uh, Steve, thanks for joining us today. And thank you all for joining us at the PRI office in Virginia at pop.org. Thank you, Chris. And thanks to everybody watching.